Hi, in this video we'll be building on our discussion about the way that computers represent data. In this video we'll be exploring the way that computers represent images, sound and text. Images are everywhere on computers. Some are obvious, like photos on web pages and icons on buttons. Even a font is a collection of images of characters. Let's look at this image of a frog. We can see the image is clear and of good quality. But what happens if we zoom in on the picture? With examining images, if you zoom in, you'll start to see small blocks begin to appear. The number of small blocks in combination are called the resolution. If we keep zooming, we can see the blocks get larger and larger. A tiny piece of the picture or a coloured block is called a picture element, commonly referred to as a pixel. This little pixel describes this little piece of information of the picture. If we had, say, 100 pixels by 100 pixels, this would give us a total resolution of 10,000 pixels. When looking at Blockly or Scratch, which you'll come to see in a following module, you can move the characters on the screen. Sometimes these are referred to as steps, but they are often referring to how many pixels to move. In this example, we ask the character to move 100 pixels forward. If I change the frog picture into black and white, it now has each pixel as being a shade of a colour from black at one end to white at another. One byte can represent one pixel. We have on this slide some examples of how you might explore image representation with students. So for the younger years we have colour by numbers, so students start to colour in the pictures realising that each little piece forms a whole picture. With older students, you might research RGB, which is red, green and blue. These are the colours that computers use to create images. Students could explore how are colouring images on computers different to using paint. This could be something that you might like to research after looking at this video. We also have an example here from Pixelface via the National Gallery of Art website. This is a great website for having students um, experiment with different resolution. They can click on the image they want to look at and the type of resolution, so whether you have really, really big pixels or really tiny pixels. And they can also play with uh, colouring in these images. Students could even design their own pixelated picture. For example, my picture of the chicken here, which I'm sure you could do a much better job. Some other extensions that you might like to do or you might like to run through with the students could be looking at learning and drawing and colouring pictures with programming tools. We have a couple of, couple of examples here, such as the Khan Academy module, and this includes drawing basics and colouring. We also include a link to a processing site where an instructor has given a series of activities where you can draw shapes and colour them. There are also a number of great activities on the CS Unplugged website where you can explore what happens when we transfer images. These are particularly in image representation and error detection, as well as text compression. Let's look at digital sound. To make digital data, the analog wave is converted into a stream of numbers and the numbers are recorded instead of the wave. This process is referred to as analog to digital conversion, or ADC. To play the music back, it converts the numbers back into analog wave by digital to analog conversion. And the analog wave comes through the output, such as your speakers. Unless there is some kind of corruption in the file, it should play the same sound every time. How are sounds collected? The sounds are processed using converters, which perform sampling. That is, they sample the height of the sound at particular intervals in the wavelength. For example, if one byte is used, there are 256 different possible heights. This is done by sampling rate and sampling precision. The sampling rate involves how many samples are taken per second. Sampling precision involves how many 
Different gradations are possible. By increasing sampling rate and the precision rate, you can reduce the likelihood of error and produce a sound that is closer to perfect. On a CD, numbers produced are stored as bytes. The data are burned into the CD as a series of bits. This essentially becomes a set of instructions for how the computer should play the sounds. The fundamental job of the CD player is to focus the laser on tiny little bumps. The laser reflects light off the CD player and the sensor detects changes in reflexivity caused by the bumps. The electronics in the drive interpret those changes to read the bits that make up the bytes. If there is a scratch on your CD, which might cause a packet of bytes to be misread, your computer uses error correction mechanisms to try and recover. And these are in some of the CS Unplugged activities mentioned before. See the error correction techniques. Music storage can include CD-ROM, which is computer data, or CD-DA, which is audio. But what about the music on your iPod or music player? These use MP3 files. MP3 is a form of compression. Using the MP3 compression system, reduces the number of bytes in a song while retaining the sound that is near CD quality. MP3 is one type of file format, but there are also others that you might be familiar with, such as WAV, waveform audio, AAC, which is advanced audio coding. An MP3 player is essentially a data storage device with software that allows for music data to be transferred to the device. MP3 players contain a series of components like display, memory, microprocessors, a data port, an audio port, among other parts that we'll explore in digital systems. The MP3 compression format creates files that don't sound exactly like the original recording. But in order to decrease the size of the file significantly, MP3 encoders have to lose audio information. If you're moving audio files from your computer to an MP3 player, your computer rips MP3 files from an audio CD. The audio is digitally compressed and encoded to create an MP3 file. The files are then transferred and played on your device. Let's have a look here at some examples about how you could explore sounds in your classroom. Students could create or follow music symbols for a particular song. Students could create patterns and then swap symbols and play one another's songs. In drama, students could listen to the sound of an animal. They could represent the dynamic with their body movement. Teachers could also play the sound of an animal or some other sound, and students have to guess what the wavelength might look like by drawing it. This area offers opportunities to link sound representation to exploring how sound travels. Now we'll briefly discuss digital text. We've covered this in the previous video, so we won't go into too much detail here. But computers transfer text using encoding techniques, like we've just discussed. Text is encoded and decoded using the ASCII system. This is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. For an example of the codes, I've put a link. Codes in the form of numbers are assigned to each letter of the alphabet, numbers and for other characters that need to, re need to be represented. Each code is represented by a byte. Let's do an activity to see how this works. Pause the video as needed. On your computer, open the notebook. This is usually found in accessories. Write a simple sentence. Save it as something like sentenced.text. Right click on the file and view the properties. How many bytes does the file contain? The number of bytes should match the characters, including spaces and full stops, of your sentence. Did that work? Did you get the right number of bytes? This is an activity that can be used with students in the class to show them how bytes represent each character. Some activities students could do in the classroom to explore the way text is encoded and decoded could involve students decoding secret messages. You can do this by using free text conversion websites. Or students could create their own coding systems. How does a computer know what the binary code represents? 
For example, as we've discussed, it could represent an alphabet letter, a pixel colour, a sample sound, or an instruction. The computer knows how to interpret the binary code because of the context. This is where the data was sent. This will be explored in more detail in Input and Output, which comes in a following module. We have some example activities in the web resources, so make sure you have a look. But please feel free to share any ideas you have in the module discussion forum. Bye for now.